break at the weight of your glory. I needed shelter, I was an orphan, but you called me a citizen of hell. how worthy he is, okay? I'm going to lift up some praise this morning. That's right.
Spirit, guide my vision, help me see the way you see. Always Jesus, ever Jesus, Christ in all is Christ in me. Holy Spirit, guide my speaking words of grace and truth of love. Let my lips be filled with stories of the mercy that I found.
flame. I see the stars. I hear the rolling thunder. Thy power throughout the universe display. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. How great thou art. joy shall fill my heart and I shall bow in humble adoration and there proclaim
sing greater you Lord Lord may that be the last thing that we ever say on this side of heaven greater you Lord great are you Lord may that never depart from our lips great are you Lord great are you Lord to keep you in perspective God so great, great are you, Lord. We lift our eyes to you, Lord, this morning, and we sing, great are you, Lord. There's no disease that can come against you, God, and we sing, great are you, Lord. No power that can come against you, Father. We sing, great are you, Lord. You're a great Father and a great King, Lord. And we sing, great are you, Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we recognize right now just your design at work. God, when you formed us in the very beginning, you, you instilled in us the breath of life. That in our DNA, our natural response is to pour out our praise to you. Our natural response is to recognize your greatness over our life over the lives of the people in our family, over the world, over this city, over our circumstances. God, your greatness and recognizing it is that our natural response is written on our hearts. We pour out our praise because you first poured out the life of your son for us. So God, we recognize your greatness. In fact, why don't we just for a second, I know this might be new to you, this might be different for you, that's okay, but can we just declare God's greatness over our lives, over our circumstances, over the diagnosis, over the friendship, over the family. So just shout out whatever you need to say. Declare God's greatness. Declare his goodness in your life. Yes. Amen. God, we love you. We thank you for who you are. You don't leave us to figure this out, that you're with us, that we get to do life with you. You speak to us. Holy Spirit, have your way in this time, this, your way in this morning. Speak to our hearts. Give us wisdom. God, we love you. And it's in Jesus' name that we all pray and say amen. Amen. Yes. It's good. So good. Hey, well, before you take a seat, can you just greet someone next to you? Make them feel welcome this morning. Say hi to someone. All right. Well, hey, welcome to Church of the City. My name is Brendan, and I serve as our city student pastor. And we're so excited to have you guys with us on a Sunday morning. Isn't this time just so special where we get to come together, we get to worship together, get to hear the word together. And so if this is your first Sunday with us or you're still a guest with us, we'd love to meet and connect you. So on the seat behind you or in front of you, there's a share with us card. Looks like this. If you wouldn't mind filling that out, and then on your way out this morning, we have a next steps area in the lobby 
where you can stop by, give us this card. We can answer maybe some questions that you might have, get you connected. And we have a free gift just for you doing that. So make sure to stop by. We'd love to meet you. And then also we have our Church of the City app and our website as well that have tons of information, all of our resources, updates in the calendar. You can go back and look at previous messages. There's tons of stuff. You can also give online through our app or our website. So uh, speaking of giving, I'm going to invite the worship host forward. And we're going to continue to worship by receiving and offering. This is something that we do as a church family here in Spring Hill. So as we recognize the importance of the, this time in receiving an offering, I just want to share with you something amazing that took place yesterday. Um, our, we have a, this ministry called Wraparound, and they have a foster care closet in the back of our church. It used to be a loading dock. It got renovated into this closet that can meet the needs of foster care families, not just here in Spring Hill, but all in uh, around Mil Middle Tennessee and hopefully even beyond that as we continue to grow. And uh, this team is amazing. They, they set up this, this whole ministry, this whole closet, and it was beautiful. And they said, it's not good enough. So they renovated it and made it even better. I thought it was, I thought it was amazing already. And they're like, no, we got to make it even better. And so uh, we have some pictures. There's a, there's a dressing room in there now. There's just tons of, of organization and clarity. And it looks good. It looks like, I mean, better than Target. I mean, it's, it's, it's legit in there. And um, so yesterday they had a open house, which they do that uh, during when the seasons change get all the fall clothes in, and invite families that have ever participated in the uh, foster care closet and as well as other families who might need it. And they served over 41 kids yesterday. Come on. Come on. Beautiful what's taking place back there. I just want to read you a story. This is from a mom who came by yesterday. She shared that finding some new clothing and shoes on a previous visit impacted the way her teen son felt about going out in public. She said she could see a visible change in his demeanor. The team wanted me to let you know that every time someone donates an item to the closet, helps sort clothing donations, meets a family to shop, they are supporting foster families. And they just wanted to say thank you guys for all that you've done to be a part of that. And so as we consider giving, when we give, we make things like that happen. We make stories like that happen where God's able to intervene in the life of a teenage boy or in the life of a little child. And, and by giving shoes, by giving toys, by giving clothes, God is able to meet people right where they're at. And so it's a beautiful thing that we get to join with God in. It's not something that God's doing alone. He wants us to participate and be a part of it. And when we give, we get to join God in those beautiful kingdom works on this earth. So with that, why don't we pray over this offering, knowing that God has so much more in store for us. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we just thank you first and foremost that you have poured out your life for us. Because of Jesus, we have a place. We have a family. We have a new story and a second chance. And so God, as we give, we give because you first gave. And we trust you that you're gonna do incredible things. And we just thank you for the, the privilege and the opportunity to join you in the work that you're doing here in Spring Hill and beyond. God, we, we know there's so much more. And so we ask that you would continue to bless this city, to use our church for the flourishing of Middle Tennessee. God, we love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, hey, well, as the worship hosts are passing around the offering, I have just a few announcements for you. Coming up, you guys know it's, it's October in like a couple days. You guys excited for October? Fall, it's still like 90 degrees and humid, but whatever. No, I'm not used to that, and I've been here almost four years now. I'm still not used to that. But uh, it's October, and so one of the things that we're excited about is on October 20th, we are having a baptism celebration Sunday. We're going to, yes, yes. We can, make, we can cheer for that. Come on. Come on. There we go. There we go. We get to celebrate those who have made the decision to follow Jesus with their lives. They've declared that he is the Lord and Savior, and we want to celebrate that. We want to join with them and be loud and proud. What they're doing is they're putting the stake in the ground and saying, this is who I am, and this is whose I am. This is who I belong to. And they're living a new life, and so we want to come alongside them. And so maybe that might be you in this room. Maybe you're looking for a next step to declare your life in following Jesus, and you're like, well, I don't know what to do. Maybe baptism might be that for you. All you have to do is go to that website and sign up and show up here on October 20th, and we'll get you in that water. If you're a student or a child, we do have a course for you, and all of that information is on the website. You can find the dates for that. Um, we just love students and 
children be able to explain the decision that they're making. So uh, we have a class for that as well. All right. Where are the parents in the room? Any parents in the room? Oh, my gosh. You can tell. <laughs> I'm a parent. It's me. You have like 40% energy. Yes, I, I, I'm so excited for something that we're going to do in October as well, October 14th. And here's the thing. I, I know it's easy to look at this and go, ah, oh, this is another thing to put on the calendar. I don't know about you, but I would say that there's nothing more important than your role as a parent and instilling in that. And I know you guys do. I definitely don't want you to undermine that you guys are that. But I know even my year of experience as parenting, I know that there's a lot of times where I'm like, man, I don't know what to do. And I would just wish that there was a place where I could talk to people about this. So this is what we're doing. Five-week course. And, and you're going to get great tools. You're going to get great teaching. That's, that's awesome. But I think some of the best learning is what happens when you just indirectly are around people that are going through their journey and get to hear what they're doing, hear their wins, hear their losses, and learn from indirect learning. So uh, that's what's going to happen. You're going to get to sit at a table with other parents who are going through similar circumstances as you. And I, don't think, I think that's going to be beautiful. So if you're a good parent or you're a terrible parent, we'd love to have you. October 14th, and so that's the first day, then it's going to continue on for, uh, I think, four more weeks, so it's going to be 630, that's a Monday night, all you have to do is go to our website, churchofthecity.com slash springhill, and you can register, uh, there is a cost, we do have child care available, and there are some book materials that you'll need to uh, order, so we're, we have that cost there for that, so register, that'd be great, uh, we're excited for that. Last thing is, if you didn't notice, in the lobby, we have our cars ministry here, led by Kelly Corley. And this is so exciting. We, we don't get to talk about this a whole lot, but when we do, it's so fun. Um, cars ministry, what they do is they take maybe some used cars or cars that people are getting rid of, and they fix them up, and then they give them to families in need. So I don't know, I don't know if you've ever experienced life without a car. Like, that, that sucks a lot. But um, we, we want to come alongside these families because what happens in in not having a car, it so affects every other area of your life. It affects your job, it affects your family, and it can actually diminish your state, your just life in general. And so we wanna serve that need, we see that as a need, we wanna serve it. And so last year we had Kelly here and uh, Spring Hill donated four cars, which I think is awesome, we should celebrate that. I only have one hand so I can only snap, but um, I think we can do more than that. I think we can do eight. You guys with me? Can we give eight cars? Come on. Come on. They're like, I don't know. I'll, do I'll donate a car. I'll do it right now. I'm not joking. Let's go. Come on. Donate a car. All right. So if you have any information, if you have want to ask any questions or check that out, they're in the lobby. Just go ask them. Hear the story. See the pictures. It's beautiful. Kelly is so passionate about this, and you should talk to her about it. All right. We're going to continue in our series, People of the Way. I'm going to invite Ashley to read the scripture for us this morning. Will you guys all stand in the honor of the reading of God's word? Good morning. I'll be reading from Acts chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. Now a man named Ananias, together with his wife Sapphira, also sold a piece of property. With his wife's full knowledge, he kept back part of the money for himself, but brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. Then Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money you received for the land? Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You have not lied just to human beings, but to God. When Ananias heard this, he fell down and died. And great fear seized all who heard what had happened. Then some young men came forward, wrapped up his body, and carried him out and buried him. About three hours later, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. Peter asked her, Tell me, is this the price you and Ananias got for the land? Yes, she said, that is the price. Peter said to her, How could you conspire to test the spirit of the Lord? Listen. The feet of the men who buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out also. At that moment, she fell down at his feet and died. Then the young men came in, and finding her dead, carried her out and buried her beside her husband. Great fear seized the whole church and all who heard about these events. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Thank you, Ashley. Hey, that wasn't the text for today. I have to teach on that now? 
You guys ready for this one? I'm totally kidding. We actually, that was the plan. You guys ready for this? Get a little hot in here, huh? Whew. I was sweating down front as she was reading it. <laughs> we, the doors are locked, so you, you can't leave on this one. Actually, what I was thinking we could do is we're supposed do we want to take a second offering right now just to make sure we're all good to go? You guys ready? I got a few more. Um, oh, man. Hey, uh, full disclosure, uh, I actually was planning on skipping over this, these 11 verses. <laughs> I, I didn't want to teach on this. I had no idea who would show up the next week if I did. Uh, and you might reveal to me what happens after we teach on this. But, um, you know, uh, actually <clears throat> what took place was I had a few uh, individuals from our church that during the Bible reading plan that we did, do you remember Acts? We read the book of Acts. I'm actually going through it a second time if you want to join with me in that. But we read a chapter a day. So we read through all 28 chapters. And I, a, Acts chapter 5, I've ha, I had a few people reach out to me and say, Derek, what do I make of this? <laughs> Should I be scared? <laughs> and uh, so because some of you have had questions, I want, to, I want to step into this text. I also want you to know that we want to be a church that will look at every text in the scriptures, not just the easy ones, not just the fun ones. Because I believe the Lord can speak to us through this text this morning, wherever you're at. So you walk in here today and you're like, this is your first Sunday. You haven't been to church in like years. And you showed up today and you're like, what? God, you have a sense of humor. Um, or whether you're a follower of Jesus for many years. Or, or maybe your faith is, is dormant and, and, and you're praying it comes back to life. Wherever you're at, I think the Lord can speak to us where we're at today. So let's pray for him to speak, okay? Father, um, we come to you right now and we thank you for your word. We believe that your word is there for a reason that you want to speak to us. We believe that your Holy Spirit wants to reveal yourself to us. Lord, that you have something in store for each one of us in this room today, where we are at. I pray for those that, um, that maybe in their past have been hurt, have been uh, burned by religion, by church, by another follower of Jesus, and they come in uh, this room today and they're a, a little skeptical, maybe a little wounded. I pray that you would bring and reveal your truth to them. And Father, I pray for those in this room that are followers of you, Lord, that, that their roots would deepen this morning, that their faith and trust in you would go to greater depths as we uh, listen to, to your word and you reveal yourself to us. We give this to you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So... Last weekend, um, my wife had me go grocery shopping for us, and I took that privilege to go visit a place called Aldi for the very first time. Have you guys familiar with this place? No idea it was even a grocery store. It's like across the street, and they're like, you know, so sneaky, I guess. And uh, I'm a big fan of Trader Joe's, and I'm kind of a fan of Aldi because of that. And so I showed up, and I didn't bring my quarter, if you're familiar with Aldi. If you don't know, you have to bring a quarter to get the shopping cart. And then it's the honor system. You're going to bring it back. You're not going to use it to do something else. I don't know what else you would use it for, but I guess, you know. Um, and so it was, it, was, it was great. I got some, we got some good food. It was, it was uh, I'm thank the Lord I can, you know, we can fill our fridge. And I'm there and I'm, you know, going through the checkout line. And I didn't know you have to buy your own bags. Did you know that too? <laughs> yeah, they're seven cents, by the way. Bring four, three extra quarters for that. Or get your, or save the environment and get some like, you know, recyclable ones or reusable ones. That's the right word I was looking for. But in that whole situation, I, uh, I, there was a lady behind me in line that it was just a little bit like she was almost too friendly. You ever had that? Where like you just could tell something was going on. And I was, I kind of just turned back. I was like, hey, you know what's going on? She's like, I think I know you. I said, not from Aldi. This is my first time here. So, um, and it just was like kind of one of those odd ones. So she's like, I, I, you look like my son. She's like, it was, it, was, it was like just one of these weird moments where she's like, you look like my son. It's like, oh, that's cool. Okay. Cool dude, I guess, you know, and must got a great haircut. I don't know. I'm super, probably super humble dude too, you know, and so uh, I'm trying to get out of the store because it was a little awkward. So I'm packing up my, my groceries, which you do, by the way, on your own at Aldi. They put a counter there for you. And um, I'm trying to get out of there fast, you know, but like, I don't want to pack them to where I don't know what I'm doing. And I put like the, you know, the pizza sauce on top or the, you know, marinara where it'll fall out and all that. But I was getting out of there fast. 
So I'm getting out, and she made her way out of line just as fast as I packed my bags, and she walks to the car with me, and she says, I just, like, like, I just need to take a picture of you because, like, I think I know you. And compared to my son, and I'm like, this is weird. I get in the car as fast as possible. I don't even worry about getting my quarterback from the cart. <laughs> I get in the car, and she starts pulling my leg. She was pulling my leg the same way I am pulling your leg right now, and that didn't even happen to me. <laughs> no woman was at Aldi. I went to Aldi. I promise you that, but no woman was, like, you know, trying to get my attention while I was there, okay? Are you guys, can we still be friends? I feel like I just like totally broke trust with every person in this room right now. I'm getting a little sweaty right now with you guys. Why am I telling you that story? Because you're not sure if you can trust anything else that's gonna come out of my mouth right now, right? And if you're a guest, I apologize. We don't ever start every sermon this way. I'm sharing that with you to prove a point that when you lie, what happens? You break trust, don't you? You lose trust. There's a little bit in the back of your mind now whenever Derek tells a story, can I trust him? I promise you I won't do that again. Maybe five years from now I'll do that again. But I, I share that because I want to make sure we understand the weight of telling the truth. You see, I, I don't think we realize how important it is to tell the truth. I think it's very easy for us to get caught up in lies. Um, lies that could be big or lies that could be small or lies that we don't think will hurt anyone, lies that um, we think are appropriate to, to protect someone. I mean, I'm guessing some of you in this room have done this before. Have you ever sent a text to someone saying, I'm on the way, but what's really going on? You're still getting ready. <laughs> you're not on the way. You're still, you're still in your house. You're finishing the episode. You know, you're, you're, doing some, you're, you're eating something, a ham sandwich. I don't know. We've done that, haven't we? That's a small lie. Parents, you know, what are you trying to teach your kids? Like, telling the truth is important, isn't it? Like, it, it's less about, we, I, I, I want to make sure my kids know, I don't expect you to be perfect. Like, you're going to mess up, but I do expect you to tell the truth. Yesterday, my son, we were cleaning the uh, countertop in our bathroom. I set the soap down at his eye level. He's four years old, and that was such a temptation for him. He took that soap out and just started pressing the top of that bottle till all the soap was everywhere. It looked like we had a bubble bath in our bathroom. And we didn't. It looked like he had like a foam beard, you know, going on there. You know, it was like crazy. I said, Hudson, what happened? Nothing. I go, we all know what happened. I just want, I just want you to say it. <laughs> you guys, parents, anybody else with me on that? I need that intentional parenting class because I just need you to say it, you know. What am I trying to teach him in that moment? Telling the truth matters. I need to trust you. When you're 18 years old and you ask to stay out a little bit later one night, we need to have enough chips in the bank there to know that I can trust you and you can trust me. And, you know, my guess is in this room, some of us have been lied to, just about all of us at some point. Some of us maybe have been lied to in really, really hurtful ways. Maybe you were in a relationship where someone lied to you. Maybe they were living a, a double life. And you're not, you're not even sure what's true anymore. You're not even sure if you can trust anyone again. Maybe some of you in this room have been lied to by, by another follower of Jesus. How hurtful is that? It's painful, isn't it? And then you wonder, can I be honest with even followers of the way of Jesus? This, this is difficult. Telling the truth matters. Because in relationship, at the core of community, we need to be able to trust one another, don't we? I need to be able to trust that what you say is true. You need to be able to trust me and what I say to be true. Trust and vulnerability work hand in hand. When we are vulnerable with someone else and they hold that information appropriately, we can trust them, can we? I, I, I talk about this almost every week because I feel like I should, because I feel like the Lord is using it in amazing ways in our community but a ministry called Celebrate Recovery exists at our church. And those of you who have gone through it, you know, you've tasted it on Tuesday nights. When you show up there and people are telling the truth, you're, I remember my first time, I was like, okay, this, that's, a, that's a lot of truth coming at me right now. <laughs> and by week three of going, I'm like, this is right. This is the kingdom of God. We had, this, we had this thing called a step study, 12 steps to recovery start on Thursday night. Over 50 men and women showed up for this thing. 
I think the Lord's using this is because people are willing to tell the truth there. And when we tell the truth, the Lord can work. At the core of community in the book of Acts, we see that the followers of the way of Jesus could trust one another. That's why we see in Acts chapter 2, 42, what happened? What did we see? People would sell all their possessions and give, them, give the money away to help care for everyone in need. How did they know what, what the needs were? They had to be willing to share what they needed, right? I, my prayer is we as a church that we would be willing and open and honest with our needs. That we, we would be willing to share. And I'm, I'm talking specifically, I know this is for everyone, but men especially in here. We can have a tendency sometimes to, you know, we got it all figured out. We pray for someone else. I'm, I'm, I'm okay right now. I'm good. And be willing to open and share, like, this is where I need the Lord to move right now. I need God to show up in this area of my life and share that. A couple weeks ago, we had a men's night, and that's what we talked about, like being willing to share, God, this is where I need you to show up and tell three other dudes about it. Be praying for that together. At the core of community is vulnerability and trust. You see, the story of Ananias and Sapphira, and if you have your Bibles, I'd encourage you to make some notes here on Acts chapter 5. If you, if you don't have your Bibles, it'll be on the screens as well. But I want to make sure you understand Acts chapter 5, that the story of Ananias and Sapphira has far less to do with money and far more to do with telling the truth in community and being trustworthy and being honest. Just put the words tr truth-telling and honesty and trust next to Acts chapter 5. Because if we don't understand this, um, like if you're in this room today and you're just trying to figure out the whole church thing and the Jesus thing, this story could be a little concerning, couldn't it? <laughs> like we need to understand what the Lord is doing and saying in this story for us to understand if we can trust him. And I think we need to know this is far less about money and far more about truth-telling. So with that in mind, let's read this together and see what the Lord can speak to us today. Verse 1, now a man named Ananias together with his wife Sapphira also sold a piece of property. Let's just stop right there. The word says also. Okay. So if we see that word, we know something happened before this. Let's look at Acts chapter 4 and let's see what took place in Acts chapter 4. Verse 32. It says, all the believers were in one heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. And with great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there were no needy persons among them. Let's stop right there. No needy persons. How could that be? People were willing to tell others what they needed. They were willing to be honest with one another. This is, this is where I need, I need help. I, I don't have enough food to get, make it through this week. I need a job. I, I, need, I need the Lord to move in my marriage. They were willing to share with one another what they needed, and the Lord moved powerfully. Last service, 9 o'clock service, I'm, I'm out in the lobby beforehand, and this couple comes up to me, and they say, did you hear about the blessing we received? This past week, I said, no. I said, tell me. They said, well, we've been dealing with some health issues. And uh, we're in a missional community where we've been able to serve others. And they, they, our missional community, th that's what we call our groups here at Church of the City. Uh, our missional community asked us what our need is. And one of, or my husband, she said, uh, shared that because of his health stuff, he has not been able to take care of the lawn. His biggest annoyance right now is he can't take care of the weeds in his lawn. <laughs> And so this past Saturday morning at 7 a.m., the entire missional community showed up with 120 bags of mulch and made that lawn look amazing. Isn't that awesome? And, and that's, a, that's a simple just, that's the simple power of telling the truth. This is where I need help. And isn't it so cool that people can come alongside them and serve them and be blessed in the moment of serving them? One of the guys that was... Uh, doing, the, doing the work, he's like, this is what I used to do for a living. I love this stuff. I'm like, you didn't get tired at bag 77 of mulch? I get tired at bag three, you know what I mean? But that is beautiful, isn't it? And then telling all the neighbors, hey, what happened to your lawn? Oh, yeah, my group from church took care of it for us. Could they come over to my house too, you know? It's beautiful. 
from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sale, put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone who had need. And then look at this, verse 36 and 37. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold a field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. This is really important to understand. Barnabas sold something, and what did he do? He gave all the money to the apostles' feet. He gave it all away. What's interesting, if you don't know this about Barnabas, is he makes an appearance all throughout Acts. Do you remember his name if you read those 28 chapters? He shows up often. He's in a place of influence as he's serving the church. How did he gain that place of influence? He was generous and he was trustworthy. He was generous and he was trustworthy. He had a good reputation. I wonder if that's what Ananias and Sapphira were looking for. Let's go on to verse 2 in Acts chapter 5. With his wife's full knowledge, he kept back part of the money for himself, but brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. It's interesting there in verse 2 to know that there was some thought in this. He talked to his wife about it. So this wasn't just like an afterthought. This is like legit, like I'm thinking about this. We talk about it. And he kept, he kept some back. Those two words, kept back, can be translated into Greek. And it's only used three times in the scriptures. Once in the book of Jude and another time in the book of Joshua chapter 7. And the translation can actually be translated as to misappropriate. To misappropriate. Have you ever had somebody in business misappropriate funds? Have you ever, have you ever been married to someone that misappropriated funds? <laughs> That's not fun. <laughs> That's what took place. And so it's, it's a quite uncommon phrase. And so I think to fully understand what this kept back means, I think we need to look at Joshua chapter 7. Can we do that together? Joshua chapter 7 gives us a little insight in what kept back looks like. Um, in Joshua 7, there's a man by the name of Achan. And uh, Achan is a guy you won't forget because he made a little mistake here. Uh, the Israelites at this point in Joshua chapter 7 had just been in battle. They'd been wandering the desert for years. And they experienced a victory in Jericho. And so when you experience a victory in battle, you get all the other people's stuff. But what's important in this story is Joshua, the leader, said that all the plunder, all the gold, all the silver, all the stuff was to be consecrated unto the Lord. Now, if you don't know what that word means, that means to be set apart. It is holy. It is sacred. It is not for your consumption. But Achan does not listen to the Lord and does not listen to Joshua in that moment. He stole some of the silver he stole some of the gold, and he dug a hole, and he put it in that hole under his tent. And guess what? The Lord knew. <laughs> and, yeah, and the Lord was not happy. The Lord was not happy. Uh, Achan ended up losing his life for this. He was stoned for this. And what do we, what do we learn from Joshua chapter 7? That you do not mess with holy things. You do not mess with holy things. What is holy in the eyes of the Lord? We do not mess with this. Side note, this is really important for us to think about. We, th we think about it only uh, mattering to money, but this matters just as much to the people we're sitting next to right now. Don't mess with holy things. I'm going to teach my kids as they, as they grow up. We don't mess with holy things. The, the people all around you, whether you disagree with them, whatever is going on, you don't mess with them. I think that, that idea should really impact our our sexual ethic. It should impact the way that we engage in marriage as a parent of our kids. We do not mess with holy things. Now, there's a, there's a lot of differences in this story in Joshua 7, but there, there's that similarity that by keeping things back is deceitful. And we don't do this with God. God is not a big fan of this. Once items or property are devoted to the Lord, they are no longer the possession of the person who gave it. Let me repeat that again. Items or property that are devoted to the Lord are no longer the possession of the person who gave it. Parents of children, you've seen this take place, haven't you? 
where you have to remind your kids of this if they've ever given a toy away to someone else. Uh, I have a seven-year-old who loves to, when she sees somebody else sad, she doesn't like seeing people sad. And so I love her heart. She'll give like her favorite toys to people when they're sad. And then the next day, she'll really regret that decision. And after like the third time dealing with this, I'm like, honey, if you give it away, it's not yours anymore. That's the principle we have here. If it's consecrated, if it's set apart to the Lord, it's not mine. It's not mine. Verse 3, then Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money you received for the land? This is really interesting because Peter was not a part of those discussions, was he? He was not hanging out with Ananias and Sapphira as they made these decisions. Peter was given supernatural knowledge of what Ananias had done. You know what this is called? This is called a word of knowledge that Peter was given. This still takes place today, by the way. People are given words of knowledge for other people. I've experienced this in my life. Maybe you have as well. I've had people tell me they've experienced visions or dreams and then have shared them with me, something connected to me, and it's been beautiful. I've also had words of knowledge get shared in our community where I've been told about people receiving insight from the Lord on a sin issue going on, and they shared that with the other person. You think that would uh, be difficult, and it, and it is to share, but it actually served that person beautifully in that moment. This is what's called a word of knowledge. This is a gifting of the Holy Spirit, and this is still taking place today. Peter experienced it right here, and he called him out on it. Look what he says in verse 4. Didn't it belong to you before it was sold and after it was sold? Wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? Have you not just lied to human beings? You have not just lied to human beings, but to God. Peter says, the money was at your disposal. The insight for us right now is this. If you were a part of the early church, I want to make sure you understand this. You were not required to sell all your property and give everything to the community. Did you know that? The early church, that was the way they operated, but it wasn't because they had to. You were not required to sell everything. Same thing is true for us today, ladies and gentlemen. So you might read Acts, you might be thinking, I gotta sell everything. No, that's not what the scripture is saying. You are not required to do so, but you are required to ask, Lord, what are you leading me to? Lord, what are you calling me to engage in this situation right now? How can I be generous in this moment? Peter, in this moment, freely acknowledged that the land and its value belonged to Ananias alone. He was completely free to do with it what he wanted. His crime was not in withholding the money, but in deceptively implying that he gave it all away. What did he do? He lied. And what do we know about community with a room full of people that lie all the time? You can't trust anybody, can you? Verse 5, when Ananias heard this, he fell down and died. And, and just, we don't know exactly how his death took place. Maybe it was a heart attack in that moment. Maybe he's like, I've been found out. I don't know. But great fear seized all who heard what had happened. Then some young men came forward, wrapped up his body, carried him out, and buried him. About three hours later, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. Peter asked her, tell me, is this the price you and Ananias got for the land? Yes, she said, that is the price. She lied as well. Peter said to her, how could you conspire to test the spirit of the Lord? Listen, the feet of the men who buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out also. At that moment, she fell down at his feet and died. Then the young men came in and, finding her dead, carried her out and buried her beside her husband. And great fear seized the whole church and all who heard about these events. I want to be very clear on what we just read. That is a description of what took place for Ananias and Sapphira. That's a description. And when you read the scriptures, it's really important to understand, is this a description or is this a prescription? Is this a, is this a description or is this prescribing what will take place? Um, I think it's very clear. I hope it's clear to you in this room that the prescription is not if you lie, you will fall dead. <laughs> We'd have nobody at church this morning if that took place. <laughs> This is describing what took place, and then we are to ask, Lord, what do you want to reveal to us? What is prescriptive for us? 
I think one thing we need to understand when you read this, and this is really important for those of you who have friends that maybe are considering following Jesus. If they come along this text, you need to have a good answer to explain what's taking place. Is God full of grace and mercy? 100%. Is God full of truth and justice? 100% couple of guardrails as you read the text that are really important for us to understand. God is always pursuing those far from him. That's how I ended up here. God was pursuing me when I was far from him. The Lord was answering all the prayers my parents and grandparents had been praying for me. God was pursuing me. And I probably lied a lot in that season. And God was pursuing me. At the same time, when I read the scriptures as a whole, not just one story, one thing I notice is that God and Jesus care deeply about what followers of Jesus are doing. He is definitely judging the insiders, isn't he? Who does Jesus get upset at the most in the New Testament? The Pharisees and the religious rulers that acted like they had it all figured out that acted like they were better than they actually were, that thought they never sinned, that they never lied. Jesus cares deeply. Jesus cared deeply about that. God cares deeply about us being truthful and honest, not lying. Because we know that if you as a follower of the way of Jesus If you lie, there is a greater implication to all those around you. If you're in this room and you're not a follower of the way of Jesus, go ahead and lie. You'll deal with natural consequences with that. If you're a follower of the way of Jesus, this really matters. So let's see what prescriptions we can take from this, these 11 verses together. Can we do that together? All right. There's a couple characteristics that we see in these 11 verses as well as all of the book of Acts. There are two characteristics. Number one, radical generosity. Everyone say radical generosity. generosity. Thank you. And remember, that's not out of obligation. That's not out of because I have to give everything away. But it's radical generosity. And the second is extreme honesty. Everyone say extreme honesty. honesty. Thank you. Let's look at the first one. Radical generosity. Ananias and Sapphira. They both wanted the image of great generosity without actually being remarkably generous. They wanted the reputation, didn't they? Because reputation does matter. We see with Barnabas, his story and his life, that reputation does matter. You gain greater influence when you make wise choices, when you're generous and when you're honest. And they wanted a shortcut. And this is where we are reminded as followers of the of people of the way of Jesus that the shortcuts are not the way of Jesus. They wanted the shortcut. They wanted to be kind of generous. And kind of generous doesn't really work. N.T. Wright says this, what you do with money and possessions declares loudly what sort of community you are. The statement made by the early church practice was clear and deafening. No, No wonder they were able to give such powerful testimony to the resurrection of Jesus. They were demonstrating that it was a reality in ways that many Christians today, who often sadly balk at even giving a tithe of their income to the church, can only dream of. Their testimony was their radical generosity. We as a church, we will not stop living generously. We will, as long as we can, as long as the Lord leads us, we will be a generous church and we will share stories like we shared earlier about the wraparound closet. And if, if you get annoyed by those, like, man, are they talking about that again? Um, I don't, you can still hang out, but like, you might get annoyed often <laughs> because we're going to talk about being radically generous. That is going to be a value of our church. And I want you to hear me. Hear me on this. I, I had a, a pastor friend share this with me, and it was so important. He said this to me, Derek, if you think that for once your generosity to our church is what matters, if you question being generous to, to our church, find some other place to give. And you know why he said that to me? Because he cared more about my heart than he did about what I could give. And I want to share that with you as well. If you think this is about, well, the church is always asking for money. I've been burned in the past. I'll be burned again. Find some place to give. I believe the Lord's doing something here. I will give here. If you believe that, you can give here. If, if you are skeptical at all, I just want to encourage you. I care more about your heart than anything else. Radical generosity. 
as you look ahead to this next month, you know, as Brendan was talking, October is two days away. It feels like it's middle of July, but um, I, I think about as we look ahead to October, what would it look like for us to pray over how we spend our money? Do you do that? Do you pray? Like, if you have a job, you're going to get an income next month. Do you pray, God, how would you have me be generous? God, what would you have me do? One of the things, my wife and I, we sat down yesterday, and uh, we, we got away from this for a season, but we have what we're calling a blessing fund for the month of October. So wherever the Lord leads that month, we want to be generous. What's the Lord leading you to do? God, what would you have me do? Great prayer to pray. Dangerous prayer to pray. Second is this, extreme honesty. This is another value and characteristic of the people of the way. It's not about the money in this story. You know that, right? It's not about the money. It's about a couple of people who started pretending that they were better than they were, and God removed them from the community. God removed them. God takes this seriously. Truth-telling is very important. Uh, my friend Matt Smallbone, who leads our East Nashville Church of the City, he said it this way, the tragedy of this story is that if Ananias had just been honest and said, hey, Peter, we just sold a piece of property, and we need a little bit of this money for some other things, and we'll bring the rest to you, Matt says this, I have every reason to believe that this entire story would have not even happened. Why is the punishment so severe? One big reason is that God wanted to preserve and protect the community. Community needs trust. It needs to be vulnerable with one another. And the Lord was watching out for us. And the church continued to grow and thrive. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. The Lord can't work with lies. Community does not work when it's built on a bunch of lies. If you've tasted that before, it tastes gross, doesn't it? God knows that when someone starts pretending, other people stop being honest and other people stop being open as well. Have you been in a group like that before? I've been in groups where like, you know, the most honest someone will get during like a prayer request time is when they say, hey, would you just pray for my best friend's uncle's dog? He stubbed his pinky toe. And so can we pray for that? <laughs> I'm all for, I love dogs. You guys know that, right? I love dogs. But um, could we just be honest in our groups with our prayer times even? Like, what do, you, what do I need? Be sel That's what I tell my, any group that I lead. I say, hey, be selfish during prayer time. Because I don't know about for women, but for men, I've noticed, like, we have a tendency to just, like, deflect any need we might have. I, the Lord can't work with lies. The Lord loves working with what we're willing to be truthful and honest about. He's a good father. He gives good gifts. Are we willing to go to him with what we need from him? My prayer for any of our groups, um, I think Celebrate Recovery is having ripple effects in our church. I think people are being honest in other areas because they've tasted the, the, the beauty. They've seen the beauty of being honest and real and vulnerable and the Lord moving in those areas. I think it's having ripple effects. I, my prayer is that Women connect that meet on Thursdays. You guys taste that there. The men, those of you who connected with other dudes, you are tasting that there, and you're going to experience freedom in your life as you're honest. May we be a church that is full of truth tellers. Those of you who have jobs, you're going to go to a job tomorrow, tell the truth. Don't cut the corner. By not cutting the corner, your testimony speaks volumes to those around you. People are going to wonder, what's going on there? What's he got that I don't have? I have a friend of mine who, um, he, he, is, he is a mentor of mine. He was the first guy, I've shared stories with you about him. He's the first guy that gave me an opportunity to preach. I was 20 years old. I think I was a Christian for like six months. I still can't believe he gave me an opportunity. I preached on Acts chapter 5, Ananias and Sapphira. I'm totally kidding. I never preached on this before. <laughs> I think I just stuck to something easy like, you know, the grace of God experienced in my life. But um, in, our, in our friendship at one point, I still remember, it's su such a weird story. But years ago, I was hanging out with him when he had to return a pair of shoes. He had worn these shoes. A friend had bought these for him. And they're actually uh, snowboard boots. And um, a friend bought these boots for him and 
he needed to use them for a couple days because he was going snowboarding, and he used them for two days. They were too tight, and he brought them back. They're, they're not cheap. If you don't know this, snowboard boots are not cheap. And um, he brought them back to the store, and he handed them to the guy. He said, hey, these are too small. Could I exchange these? And the guy behind the counter said, have you worn these outside yet? And uh, my friend Clint said, yeah, I actually snowboarded in them for two days. And he said, okay, well, we can't return anything that you've worn outside the store. So I'm going to ask you again, have you worn these boots outside yet? And my buddy Clint said, ah, sorry, I just told you that I wore them outside. Uh, so you know the answer. The guy behind the counter, let me say this again. I'm going to ask you again. I can't return these if you've worn these outside. Have you worn these outside? Yeah, yeah, dude, I have. Just say these words, I have not worn these outside. <laughs> and my buddy Clint, he's like, dude, I, I can't do that. It's not true. And the guy behind the counter, he's like, ah, forget it. I'll take them anyways, and you'll get a new <laughs> pair of boots. He was so mad, so annoyed. Isn't it so, it's such a dumb story, but it was so important for me to see a mentor in my life in a moment where it would have been way easier to lie. Nobody would have been hurt. Burton, whoever made the snow, they wouldn't have been, oh, our bottom line is down $70 because of these boots. But he was honest and truthful. And I saw that. And, and it's challenged me because there's moments where it's so easy for me to just shade the truth. I can tell a story where it makes me look better than I really am. None of you have probably ever done that. Or returning something a little easier to just say, you know, shade the truth a little bit. Be a truth teller. When it comes to prayer requests, tell the truth. What do you need? What do you need? When we have that prayer time at the end of this service today, we're going to come down front and I'm going to say, hey, do you need any prayer? You got something on your heart right now? Come down. Come forward. Share that. Give the opportunity for the Lord to show up. Share your shortcomings. Confess to one another. If you're in community, find someone that you can confess to and see the Lord work powerfully in that. When we are vulnerable with others, it gives the chance for them to be accountable with us. I think that's one of the gifts of Celebrate Recovery, by the way, is like you have accountability built right in. In your marriages, ladies and gentlemen, if you are married, tell the truth. Let the Lord show up as you speak the truth to what's really going on in your marriage. My wife and I, um, this past week, just celebrated 15 years of marriage, and we got some time away. Thank you. And, um, and we got some time away, and it was really beautiful. We had, a, we had an eight-hour car drive, and it was, I'm, I was really glad that for that car drive, I don't know if you guys have ever done a car drive where, like, if you're not on good speaking terms, it's a really difficult car drive. You guys have probably never experienced that, maybe just in our, uh, but it was a beautiful car drive. We were on a great spot in our marriage. It was so refreshing. We got a couple days away, and um, we had this moment where we talked about things we're afraid of. I don't even remember the last time I had a conversation with my wife about what I'm afraid of or what she's afraid of. It was beautiful. I know how to pray for her at a deeper level because I know what she's afraid of. Tell the truth to your spouse. Tell the truth to your kids. Confess where you haven't. See the Lord work in and through that. I'm going to invite the worship host forward. And they are going to distribute a meal for us. It's the Lord's Supper, communion, the Eucharist. There's two cups, there's bread and there's juice. If you're not at a place to receive this meal, you can let that tray go by. But this is a meal that we take together every week to remind us of the importance of community. And to remind us that God does lead with grace. So when you read a story like this and you just want to look at the truth, truth is important, justice is important, telling the truth matters, but God leads with grace. He gave us his son Jesus while we were still sinners. So you can read a story like this and be reminded, while I was still a sinner, God sent Jesus for me because he is pursuing me. So if you need to be reminded that you are pursued by God, this meal is for you.
And as the elements are passed, I want to ask that you hold on to those. We'll take them together. But as they're passed, I want to wrap this up. You might be asking the question, what happened to Ananias and Sapphira? Does anybody else have that question? Like, okay, they got struck down. They might have died from a heart attack. We don't know. What happened to them? The late Eugene Peterson would tell his students that when you don't know an answer, that when a storyteller leaves gaps in the story, there is an implicit invitation for us to enter into it, to, to participate in it. We are not permitted to do anything we wish with that or imagine anything we wish. We are constrained by the context. By this revelation we have been given, but within the constraints of the revelation of God showing himself to us, we are invited to participate and bring our prayerful imaginations into the text. My, my prayerful imagination is that someday in heaven, I will meet Ananias and Sapphira. That's my prayer. That's my prayerful imagination. I, I love to be reminded of the grace of God. This meal is a reminder of the grace of God. I know that as I... Last service, we had a time of um, reflection and confession. I, re I, remind, I was reminded of a few spots this past week where I lied. And I love to be reminded of the grace of God. I, I'd love to believe that for the good of that community of believers, that early church, they were removed. So that community conti could continue to flourish and thrive in honesty and truth-telling. It was protected. And maybe that was the best thing for Ananias and Sapphira as well. That's my prayerful imagination. This meal reminds us of the grace of God. So if you need to be reminded of the grace of God, I want you to hold the elements together. And Jesus tells us that this bread is his body, broken for you and broken for me, pursuing us, pursuing you. Let's take and eat together. This cup, Jesus tells us, is his blood, the new covenant. No other sacrifice needs to be made. Let's take and drink together in community. Please stand with me. I want to invite the prayer team to come down front. We've been, we've been closing every service in this Acts series with a chance to pray for the Lord to move. Signs and wonders to take place. It's so cool hearing from some of you things we've prayed for, the Lord answering prayers. Continue to share those. If you need prayer, come forward. We'd love to pray with you. I want to give you a prayer of blessing as you leave here today. May the Spirit of God give you all the courage you need to tell the truth. To live generously with your life. May he give you moments this week where you can choose truth and generosity. And as you do, as you do, my prayer is people will ask questions about you. They will want to know more about Jesus as you press in. And more and more will be added to this community, those who are being saved. In Jesus' name, amen. Grace and peace. Love you guys.